Hi, I'm Mitch Jackson, um, private practice in Chicago, Illinois for 23 years. And uh, it's been great being in solo practice for that long. Today is hard to be a surgeon. I've been in practice 23 years and been doing this for 27 years. When I first started out, it was really easy. You know, I mean, I didn't have as much going on. When I first started, I was just trying to feed my family. But now, as you evolve and um, grow the practice and involve in clinical studies and we're bringing new technologies in, the reason why I actually became an ophthalmologist, you know, my dad was partially sighted from bacterial meningitis growing up in Scotland. And it made me want to go into research and figure out ways for new therapies, whether it's surgical or pharmaceutical. And clinical studies have the proper regulation, I think. I think it's outside once something's FDA approved. You're worrying about pharma and I haven't made guidelines. Can I use the technology in the right way? I'm not trying to promote it for a company. I'm trying to do what's best for the patient. But we have regulation like you can't do femtosecond laser, for example, cataract without astigmatism management. Well, why would you cheat the patient on something that would be so beneficial for them in their visual recovery because you didn't do astigmatism management? To me, that's like kind of crazy. Um, but that's regulation. But why would you withhold great technology as an example from a patient because they didn't have astigmatism? So those are the things that are kind of outreaching, in my opinion. There is thing, things in front of Congress, like the AIMS Act, that if that gets approved, then all that goes away. Patients can just pay for what they want and use the technology, and that will be huge. It's no different than like when crystallins, presbyopia correcting eye wells, got approved in the early 2000, 2003 or whatever. First, patients couldn't pay above and beyond. Medicare, they had to pay full price until I sent all my patients to my congressman down the street. <laughs> And they, they begged them, and then hopefully they voted, and they did finally, and they created the CMS ruling, and now that regulation, which was crazy, is gone. And now patients can pay above and beyond what the insurance pays for advanced technology. Well, that's how it should be. It makes sense. You can't withhold technology if it's available to a patient. So that's where you wonder, how am I going to be a surgeon? It's hard to be a surgeon when you have technology and you sometimes can't use it, and that's not really fair to a patient. Actually, the clinical trials are as much as it's a pain in the, you know what, to do studies. I love doing studies. And so from the beginning, I've always wanted to be involved in clinical studies. The good thing about clinical studies is at least it's, it's the same. There's regulation, and that's the part where regulatory should be involved because you want to make sure the data isn't skewed, safety, and all the other things that are important with clinical studies. I think outside of clinical studies is where the regulation, once something's FDA approved, or once something CE marked in Europe, and for example, you know, we all talk about the CE mark has to do with safety. We want safety for patients. But does anybody ever tell Boeing how to build a plane? No, build, Boeing knows how to build a plane. So just like Mac knows how to do a computer, so why does the government with the FDA, nothing wrong with the FDA, I, I'm all for safety, they should regulate safety, like the CE mark, we're here at the ESRS meeting, so it's a perfect topic. But why are they telling surgeons and companies how to develop a device that's gonna make surgery better when we're not gonna use it if it's not gonna work better? So, but they should regulate safety. So that's where I think, that's where it gets kinda, and so we fall behind a lot with devices and therapeutic, uh, pharmaceutical therapies to be approved in the United States because nothing wrong with the FDA, but they should really stick to safety more than the worry about efficacy. LASIK's a great procedure. I've had LASIK myself in uh, 2000, 15 years ago. And, uh, and I had like first generation technology pretty much. You haven't wished you waited. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't wait because okay. it's been a great 15 years. And I thought for sure that once I had, I'm thinking, why are more people having this done? So the, the real reason why LASIK didn't get the play it was supposed to get is you could do perfect LASIK surgery on a patient and still have a bad outcome. 
And that's because you didn't pick the right patient in the first place. They weren't good candidates. So that's where the learning curve is with LASIK, is picking the right patient. You know, whether it's looking at topographies correctly, uh, there's genetic testing now for corneal dystrophy, the Avelino test, that adds a layer of safety. So safety is really important with LASIK. I think that's what the, the mass population is fearful of blindness on elective procedure. They've heard things like dry eye and whatever it might be. Well, you just have to have, I turn away 22% of people who come through my door because I'm making sure that the candidates we do LASIK on, at least, you know, statistically, are gonna have the greatest chance to succeed. And the other two, 22%, there's other technologies that come down the road. You know, cross-linking's coming. It's not FDA approved yet in the United States. There's a lot of things. There's more genetic testing now. There's a lot more things. For example, keratoconus, hopefully there'll be a genetic test in the future for that. That'll help reduce the risk for corneal lactation post-LASIK. So there's great stuff we have now. There's more coming. The PRAL studies were done recently that looks at, you know, looking at the military. I mean, you got naval craft, Air Force jet fighters saying they perform better landing that jet on a, on a carrier post-LASIK than with their contact lenses pre-LASIK. So that alone with G-forces is saying a lot about the procedure. And if as long as they were a good candidate. It's the same process. There's things you look at differently, like angle kappa. You got to look at astigmatism management, ocular surface management. There's a lot of new things we're learning. The good thing is the newer low ad generation multifocals, at least in the United States, that we have, and there's more coming uh, that Europe and the rest of the world has, that are really getting better in their design, and so there's less side effects. It should never be debilitating. So if you do the proper due diligence and look at things like how much astigmatism is there, how much uh, angle kappa is there, um, is their cornea irregular, do they have a, uh, uh, an OCT, the macula, do they have an ERM or macular pucker that could take away from the, the end result of a multifocal. So you have to have to do your due diligence, no different than LASIK. And there's other, there's crystallines and true line, aspheric optics that don't split light, might be better for those patients, or might just go with the basic monofocal and just get them seeing better. Yeah, so refractive, cataract surgery is refractive, sure. period. You can't be a cataract surgeon for, Nothing. What's the phenomenon of refractive cataract right. surgeons? Yeah. So cataract surgery is, is refractive surgery because you're changing the eyesight. Sure. So no matter what, you need to do the proper technology if you're going to do stuff for patients. You know, it, it's your responsibility to do the best for the patient. So femtosecond laser is a, is a game changer. Um, by lessening the amount of trauma in the eye, it gives people faster vision recovery. Sure. Um, that's the main advantage for that technology. Not whether we do an astigmatic incision or not, but that's regulatory again. But we gotta follow the rules so we can get the technology to our patients, but that's not the bottom line. The bottom line is getting them see and safer. Pseudoexfoliation cases, trauma cases, brunescent, really dense cataract changes, femtoseconds, a game changer for those patients. Um, then you have to be able to do advanced diagnostics, pre-op. So whether you use LensStar, Eyewell Master, they're all getting better. Uh, I'm on the most current generation with those technologies. You have interoperative aberrometry, you have you know, Aura, you have Holos now. There's a lot of different companies coming out with things that make a difference. A lot of patients have, my practice I have, I'd say 60 to 70% are post-refractive surgery, coming in for cataract surgery now. So having interoperative aberrometry and um, devices such OPD3 and the AccuTarget, which really gives me all the extra diagnostics to looking at objective scatter index, angle cap, uh, astigmatism, posterior corneal astigmatism, all those things, if you do everything right, you're going to nail the target. Sure. And that's what you have to do as a, today as a cataract surgeon. If you kind of say you don't need any of that stuff, then you shouldn't be doing cataract surgery because you're not doing the right thing for the patient. Uh, Smile is going to have its place. It's a great technology. I've actually demoed it. I'm not in their clinical trial. I look forward to it. We actually look to bring that technology to our office. We're planning on it because I'm a full spectrum refractive surgeon. Um, it will have its place, I think, in cases that are more borderline uh, LASIK cases because it might add a level of safety in how we're removing tissue. Um, but I'm not sure yet. It depends on how the FDA is going to approve the device. Um, but 
the data is no worse than LASIK, and it's probably going to su surpass LASIK in terms of, but you'd have less of the ocular surface issues post-op. So the recovery time is going to be faster. Some of the problems post-op, like LASIK neurotrophic epitheliopathy that we all know is pretty much going to be eliminated with SMILE, and that's going to be its huge advantage. Uh, majority of it is irregular topography or too thin a cornea. Um, and then after that, I know I can manage their ocular surface. So if they qualify, unless they have an autoimmune disease. So if, the, if you look at the data, uh, I did a, uh, a big talk at ACOS um, a year ago, and I had to look at all the problem type cases in LASIK, whether it's large pupils or is it autoimmune diseases. The dry eye, the biggest autoimmune disease you should avoid in LASIK based on the literature is Sjogren's syndrome. So the good news, we have early detection of Sjogren's now with a test originally created by NICOX with IMCO and now it's with Bausch & Lomb. It's the show test. It detects early proprietary antibodies that picks up the disease much earlier than the traditional Rho and La antibodies later in the disease once you already have the disease and everything's burnt out. So I think LASIK surgeons, if you think there's any risk for a patient with ocular surface disease, should probably do the early show test and make sure they have no risk for post-op corneal problems. So I haven't done that routinely. I, I kind of cherry pick which cases should get show testing. We do Avelino genetic testing because that that's a known one in 800 or one in 870 if you look at the Asia population. But that's a granular dystrophy that can affect sight later if you do any type of corneal procedure. So we try and add all the extra value-added safety factors in LASIK for patients, whatever it takes. But going back to ocular surface, I think you can manage it unless they have a true autoimmune disease. Uh, depends on the type of ocular surface condition. It's not, not sure. it's, it's, so if it's not autoimmune, it's something just you know, tr just uh, dry eye, then I would do, um, you know, we analyze everything from tear osmolarity to MMP9 um, to tear breakup time, corneal and conjunctival vital dye stainings, and we do lipid view analysis. So we have a full spectrum for ocular surface in our practice. And so depending on how that turns out, they may need lipo flow, a patient may need IPL, a patient may just need a better uh, artificial tear regimen specific for their condition. Uh, they may need topical cyclosporin, they may need a short course of topical steroids. So it just really depends on the level and severity of the dry eye. Um, and there's a lot of other treatments out there and that are coming soon and that are exciting that will probably help the ocular surface world much better. Um, did Jackson eyes like Disneyland uh -huh. in ophthalmology? <laughs> it's fun. Um, we, I, I just feel it's part of, you're going to actually take on dry eye and make it part of your practice, then I owe it to the patient to make sure I do it the right way. If I decide I'm going to do LASIK, then I'll make sure I do it the right way. We just launched camera inlays last week. And so we made sure we have all the right testing. You have to invest. You have to get an AccuTarget. You have to be able to look at Pekinji imaging. We have OPD3, look at Angle Kappa. You have to look at all those. Um, if you're going to be a cataract surgeon, you need to have an OCT of the macula. You need to have a corneal topography. You need to look at all the advanced diagnostics to be able to pick the right lens implant for a patient. So whatever specialty you are, you need to have the right toy. So I've decided to do ocular surface and refractive and refractive cataract. So we've gotten all the diagnostics that are at least available in the United States in the practice. So you've gone all in? I've gone, you, once you're in, you gotta go all in. I mean, it's the right thing to do for patient care. <laughs>